All right, we're here with Colm Wolf, three times New Zealand's strongest man and two time world's strongest man competitor. Uh, I just want to say thanks for coming down and talking to us a bit about your uh, journey in the, in the sport of strongman. Um, but first, let's set the scene and paint a picture of uh, early life, Colm growing up. Talk to us a little bit about where you were born and raised and, and schooling and, and sports in early life. Oh, that far back. <laughs> um... Well, I wasn't born in a hospital. I was born in a house, so uh, it seems pretty important. But um, no, I grew up West Auckland, went to Green Bay Primary uh, High School out in Henderson. And in high school, like, I didn't really play any sports or anything. I liked the old bull rush at lunchtime. But um, yeah, I was pretty lazy, just fat and lazy throughout school, liked games, and then I, uh, I basically fell into the gym because I was a big fan of Brock Lesnar, the wrestler, and I was massive traps. And yeah. I was like, man, I would love to be a wrestler one day and I want to get massive traps. And um, when I Googled it, the, a lot of people suggested powerlifting or that sort of thing. So yep. I kind of went into powerlifting. And you started weight training about 16 years old. And in those early days, you did a bit of uh, dabbling in some MMA. Yeah, I did. Um, like I was just training on my own at home and then I got into MMA, I think when I was like 19 or something like that. Did that for a few years, but I kind of did powerlifting at the same time, but it was like I wasn't very good at either. So it was kind of casual, I suppose. And you ended up at Gilly's Ave? Yep, I did some powerlifting at Gilly's Ave for a while. That's where I learned, learned the basics. And you remember your first uh, powerlifting comp? We're talking 2009. Remember any other numbers from that early comp? Um, I think it's going to be maybe like a 200 deadlift or something like I th that. I know for a fact you're overinflating that. It was a 190 deadlift. 190, yeah. yeah. And uh, I don't know what I would have benched and squatted. <laughs> Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I'll, uh, I'll link the, the full comp uh, rundown in the show notes. But so... In that period of early powerlifting, at some point along the line, um, you ended up at AUT, um, yep. and you spoke about how one of your lecturers, uh, Justin Keogh, ran one. a strongman club. Yep. Talk to us a bit how you got into strongman through through Justin at AUT. So I was still doing more MMA at that time, um, and what I liked, like being a taller guy, and at that time, like I wasn't very heavy. I would have been just over a hundred or something like that maybe one tennis doing MMA. Um, so compared to like the other guys in powerlifting, I was getting smoked. Um, and then he was, Justin would always say to me like, come on, just give this a go. And things like farmer's walk and that, I just picked it up and loved it instantly because it was kind of a mix of everything. You know, you're not just stood on the one spot lifting heavy, but you're picking something up and running with it or yep. that sort of thing. It's a lot of fun. So while you were at AUT, obviously you were studying. Talk to us a little bit about uh, your, your time there. Um, so I originally, at first, I got what I was trying to do wrong. I wanted to be a nutritionist and then sort of figured out halfway through that my degree would not allow me to do that. I was doing the Bachelor of Sport and Recreation. Um, so I did the undergrad. I didn't really put any effort into it, to be honest. I was young and just mucking around. Um, started working at the AET gym for a year after I finished. And then I was like, um, I liked the exercise science side of things, the biomechanics, which uh, Justin got me into quite a bit. So then I went back and did my master's degree um, wow. in exercise science with a, uh, and my thesis was on strongman training as well. So it, it was pretty cool to see like the research process and that. Yeah, the acute physiologic effects of strongman training, I think it was called. Yep, that's the one. All right, well, uh, fast forward a little bit now to uh, your first time giving a, a comp a go competitively. Uh, talk to us about that first comp uh, on the North Shore. Do you remember much about it? Uh, a little bit. I remember it was a lot of fun. I remember coming third. Um, and I can't... Uh, the main thing I remember is I wore like a... It always... It still haunts me now that I failed this, but I was wearing a slick shirt and the log, I just could not clean it. So I... Something that always, even now, sticks to me. Like if you're going to do heavy log or whatever, try to wear a cotton shirt. Now they've got the grip shirts, which is even better, but yeah, that sort of dry fit material, it just slipped off. So that's the importance of competing though. You learn those sort of- Exactly. Those, those little tips. 
All right, so we'll fast forward a little bit. 2012 New Zealand Strongest Man at the Easter Show. You're 23 years old. You're still only weighing 125 kilos. First time um, you'd ever entered New Zealand Strongest Man and ended up being the first competition that you'd actually won. Talk to us a little bit about uh, that first New Zealand Strongest Man title. It was good. It was good. No, no comp for me. I don't think is ever going to top that. Um, just being the first one, and it was such a, it was really close. Um, with Sam Miguel, me and him were super close on points. Um, we had John McFarlane there as well, Nick Hansen. Um, and in every, I think every event except for one, a uh, New Zealand record was broken for wow. that time. Obviously now like the weights are heavier and whatnot, but for that time. Um, so yeah, it felt good to win it in a year that was still like a very strong lineup and where the performances were still good. At that time, like I wouldn't really consider myself the strongest. It just felt like I had the perfect comp while the other top, like the stronger guys, um, they had those mistakes that yeah. cost them quite a lot. So fast forward to 2013, you had your chance to go back to back. Do you remember much about that second New Zealand Strongest Man um, encounter? <laughs> yeah, I remember I trained super hard. So I was super motivated after that first one. I came in like, in good shape, really confident. Um, and then I believe, I think Sam was out injured. Um, Jono had retired and Nick Hansen, so it was Nick Hansen. I remember he came up and he skipped a whole event because he had a like a rehearsal for a wedding or something like oh, that. Man. So I kind of, I realized like strongman's great, but this veteran guy, like he still sees the, um, you know, the limitations you can't, like you still have to live your life. And For so sure. I, at, cause if you compared us at the time, I was just a young student, like nothing much in my life. I could devote everything to it. All right, so 2014, your third uh, crack at a New Zealand Strongest Man title, looking for the three-peat. Uh, first time competing with uh, Matt Rag at New Zealand Strongest Man, Rongo Keem was there for the first time. Talk to us a little about uh, 2014's New Zealand Strongest Man title. That was good. That was another good year. Um, it was a pretty strong lineup again with, yeah, the addition of Matt and Rongo and then still having, I think Sam came back that year as well. Um, yep. Ruben was there too. Yep. And Ruben, that's right. And uh, so Ruben, Ruben could have, if it wasn't for his same thing, like I, I felt like I came in really good shape, yep. really well across the board. Um, but Ruben still could have won. It was just that one, one weakness was the overhead that cost them. So when I look back on each comp, I kind of remember lessons, I suppose. So like that, that really taught me the focus is to be well-rounded um, because he, he won a lot of events that year. Um, yeah, I think he won over half of them. Yeah. Uh, so I, and what got me with the win was just being consistent. Um, but yeah, really that, that taught me that lesson. You got to be consistent. So not long after that, you and your partner decided that you wanted to move to Australia. Uh, talk to us a little about what prompted that move, where you moved to and where you trained um, in Australia when you got over there. Uh, so basically we just moved over with the hopes of earning more money, more opportunities. Um, and I was, we were living in Brisbane, so I trained a lot at uh, Valhalla Brisbane and then I'd go down to Cocos at the Gold Coast. Um, yep. And yeah, it was good though. I, I definitely learned a lot while I, I was over there. Obviously over in Aussie, it was, uh, had grown quite a lot compared to New Zealand at the time. New Zealand's still behind, but it's catching up. But yeah, it was pretty, pretty good. And talk to us about some of those uh, early jobs that you had over when you were over there. So quite <laughs> labor intensive. Uh... Yeah, uh, furniture removals. That was what I got like the second day I was there or something. Um, and yeah, it was rough. It was rough. I still, it's my PB, 17 and a half hour shift. Jeez. I don't know how I did it. Uh, so I still have nightmares about that. So what's harder, yeah, furniture like... moving or uh, strongman com competitions? I definitely felt like it was that uh, furniture removal. <laughs> That was tough. Like being big doesn't help either. Like you still have to fit through the door frames and that. So yeah, man. if you're carrying something and then you have to go through a frame, like it just doesn't work. So 2015, Australia's strongest man. We're going to touch on that a little bit. Uh, six events over two days. You're competing with guys like Warwick, Br Warwick Brandt and uh, Luke Reynolds and, and, and people like that. Talk to us about um, competing at Australia's strongest. Yeah, that was good. Um, that was like my, I was pretty hyped for that. That was the first 
So I think the the Arnold had happened first, where I did the amateur comp. Yep. And then, so I was like, I was feeling that had been my first comp overseas. I had won it, so I was feeling super cocky, basically, super confident in myself. And then I was like, man, this ASM comp has got a super strong lineup. Warwick Bryant, world's strongest man finalist, never got into uh, face a world's strongest man finalist before, so I was super pumped. And um, it was in like quite a remote area. I think it was Bendigo. I can't remember the name, but um, yeah, it was a small town, which was, it was just funny. It was a small town, but with some really strong, like high level dudes there. Um, and that was where I learned the lesson of, you just have to be like strong basically. So again, going back to the log mistake in that one, I had relied very much on a powerful uh, jerk. Um, but when with an unstable surface, so we were on, as happens at Strongman, like I'm not complaining at always, you can't, even at World's Strongest Man, like you, you're not going to get a nice indoor flat surface. You have to be ready to adapt. And um, because I relied so much on a strong, powerful leg drive, I just couldn't adapt to that situation. Whereas Warwick and I think maybe Luke um, didn't really matter. They had just super strong shoulders. They could still use a little bit of leg drive. Yep. But um, yeah, what's the word? The margin of error is a bit a bit higher with that uh, jerk. Yeah, jerk. For sure. All right, so 2016 Arnold Australia. It's your first pro comp. You get to lift in front of Arnold Schwarzenegger himself. What was it like competing with guys like Hafthor, Zadruna Savikas? I think Rads was there. Talk to us about that first experience competing as a pro. It was pretty cool. I was definitely starstruck. And obviously the size, like the first time seeing Thor in person was like pretty ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I loved how they were, like to them, it's, it's their job. So it was very, it was very casual to them. That's where I suppose I got to see the mindset of you're just kind of relaxed um, and then you have to suddenly switch it on. So you can't be all amped up, you know, for eight hours of the day or whatever when you're competing. And these guys do it so often, they'll just be kind of relaxed. Um, they attempted a world record, but even like 20 minutes before for that log world record, like, you know, he's not pacing big Z, he's not pacing back and forth, like getting super hyped. Like he probably was like just sitting here, like with his eyes closed, wow. half napping. So later in that year, you get the opportunity to compete at your first World Strongest Man 2016 in Botswana. Um, talk to us about how that opportunity came about, how they kind of contacted you, what was involved in that whole process and, um, and how you ended up in, in Africa. Yep, so that year, they had a lot of injuries. So again, with what happens in Strongman, you sort of have to be ready when the opportunities arise. Um, they had a lot of injuries. They hadn't had someone from New Zealand and I had performed well at that Arnold at the start of the year against, again, competing with those top guys. Um, and Colin just sent me a message on Facebook and was like, are you, wow. you know, uh, like you came for Worlds. He obviously knew I would be, but I was like, yep. And then he was like, okay, what's your email? Um, sent through some stuff. You have to get a medical checkup, um, you know, send through all your passport details, that sort of thing. Yep. Then they book your flights and away you go. It's not much notice, but that's how it is. And that would have been like a dream come true for you. Yep. Yep. It was a big... Um, big learning curve in that I've never done that much travel before. Getting from, I was in Brisbane at the time, Brisbane to Botswana was pretty rough. So they still, those top guys between the events, they're still relaxed, but at Worlds you can really see like they're not holding back at all. It's like that is the peak of their year. Um, so it was pretty cool to see. So you're there with 30 of the best athletes in the world and you've got guys like Thor, um, Janashia, Terry Hollins in, in your group. And, and we know you're a big guy, you stand at 6'5", but you're actually the shortest in your group. I don't know if you know, know that. Talk to us a little bit about the events. Um, you, you had the keg toss and the fingers, fingers and things like that. You remember much about how the events went for you? Yeah, I remember, I remember not doing well. <laughs> um, but I also remember they had stacked our group with kind of, yeah, a lot of tall, relatively athletic guys yep. where we would have done quite well if you had split us up. This is the other thing they do at Worlds is each group doesn't do the same events in the qualifiers. Um, yep. So like where we started at was sort of the halfway point of other groups in um, keg toss. It's crazy, eh? So it was, yeah, it was funny just because it was all the, the tall guys in that one group. So 
May of 2017, you get the opportunity to go back to Botswana for your second appearance at World's Strongest Man. Uh, talk to us about that second uh, run that you had at World's Strongest Man, and, and you finished a bit better uh, this time around. You had guys like Brian Shaw, JF Caron um, in your group, and, and you finished ahead of guys like Mark Felix and, and Tom, Tom Stockman. Talk to us a little bit about um, your second Worlds and, and maybe even about what your thoughts on the last man sto uh, standing stones and things like that. Um, I was pretty happy with that second Worlds. The, what annoyed me, like it was out of my control, my goal going into it, because at the time, Tom Stoltman was not what he is now. Mm. He was still a young guy, much smaller. Not He was still strong, obviously. So my goal was to finish ahead of those two. But I felt like them getting injured um, took away from that. But the, the thing is, I still did, even after they had left, I still had beaten either Balsack or JF in the other events. Um, so it was, yeah, to me it felt like I still performed well beating the, that level of person. Um, and the two events that really let me down were my log and my deadlift. Yep. For some reason that year I had also come last in both those events at the Arnold. Um, so it was like a, a prevailing thing for me that year. But and, yeah, and all the other events I had come third, so I was pretty happy. Um, but that was cool to see, because that was the year that Eddie Hall won. Um, and it was cool to see because those top three of Thor, Brian and Eddie, there, that was obviously a very like intense yeah. rivalry. And you could almost feel the tension, even in the qualifiers. And um, I know there was a lot of frustrations with the different guys getting, you know, the different events is how it is. But um, yeah, it was, it was just cool to see that, uh, to be there and see that. So 2017, you decide to move back to New Zealand, um, you move out of Auckland. Talk to us a bit about um, why you decided to make the move back to New Zealand, why you moved up north, and um, what kind of work you came back into. Yep. Um, I mean, ultimately, it comes out of money. <laughs> we moved back to, because uh, we weren't, oh, we were doing all right, but we missed the family. There were more opportunities back here at the time. And then my partner had the opportunity to basically do the same thing she was doing over in Aussie, but as her own business. Uh, and she's in the field of podiatry. So we moved back and then moved up to Whangarei. Um, and I was just doing online coaching and then got a job glazing, uh, which I had been doing. Now moved on into PTing and still doing the online coaching. Um, so talk to us yeah. a little about uh, your online coaching, um, how it all works and what it is you're trying to achieve with, with coaching online and in person. Uh, so the big difference with online is most of my clients, they tend to be a lot more self-motivated um, because it tends to be an intermediate level person who already goes to the gym. They just want that extra bit of guidance, um, yeah. you know, to point them in the right direction. So 2018, you make the decision to give another powerlifting competition a crack. You compete in the New Zealand Open, which was the first time that it ran. Your first powerlifting competition in four and a half years came away with a 350 squat 390 deadlift 967 and a half total what made you decide that you wanted to give powerlifting a crack again and um, tell us a bit about the comp were you happy with what you came away with um, yeah i was pretty happy um basically what made me want to do it I, I like the idea i suppose of just being strong overall it gets a bit muddied when you talk about it as a sport because there's obviously specific rules say you're allowed to hitch you're allowed to use suits and whatnot. Yep. So I always liked the idea for to be strong, you should be able to be strong anywhere, like in any lift. If you walk into a gym and someone, some random person was like, um, I can kill more than you, you should be able to hold your own, even in a bicep curl. Obviously it's not a strongman event. That's sort of how I think about it though. Like you're just strong overall. And what I hadn't seen done, but possibly, oh, actually what it was, I was really inspired by Kate Mitchell she had done the Arnold, the pro Royal powerlifting, and then she won the Arnold strongman at the same, like the same uh, venue and whatnot. Wow. She did it like two days later or something like that. So I loved that. I wanted to do my version of it with the powerlifting, the NZ Open, which was a new thing. And then the New Zealand strongman series pro show, which was two weeks after that. So I thought it would be cool to win both of them. And you um, did. So we'll fast forward that two weeks. Uh, you won the first New Zealand Strongman Series Pro Show. 
and you decided to tear your tricep tendon. Yep. Tell, talk to us a bit about the injury and, and how um, that kind of prevailed in your training for a long time. It took you a long time to get that pressing strength and that stability back in the tricep. Yeah, it's a funny one because um, I didn't think it was that big a deal at the time. Basically, I was doing log. Um, it wasn't going well in the warm-ups um, or the, the attempts, whatever it was up to. And I, this is another lesson, I let my ego get involved and I did not, I knew I should reduce my attempts but I stuck to them, failed the lift and tore my tricep tendon. So at the time, I didn't think it was that big a deal. Went straight back to work the next day. Um, so yeah, a lot of bruising started coming up. Um, my wife was like, we really should get this checked out. So she found a physio that could see me that evening. Um, she had a look at it and was like, you need to get a scan. Um, eventually, like a few different things happened, but the just with the whole ACC process, I got the surgery maybe a month, a month later. Um, and uh, I was just a bit bummed out with the whole thing. I felt like I had gotten, so after we moved back to New Zealand, um, I had sort of stopped prioritizing training so much just to take a bit of a break to focus on work and whatnot until those comps were coming up. Then I was like, okay, I'm going to focus on these, yep. do those two comps. That's going to set me up really well for the Arnold the following year. And uh, I believe that got me the invite as well, winning mm. that comp for that pro Arnold. Yep. And then um, I even remember speaking to Aaron and I was like, I was pumped after I won it and I didn't think it was that big a deal. I remember messaging him like, oh, so when are the events coming out? Yep. And then, um, yeah, I, it just put me back. I wasn't, obviously couldn't compete, had to get the surgery. And so I was like, man, I guess I'm just gonna take a break, um, go through the rehab. And yeah, so I, I had, since I had started Strongman, I had never really had an extended break. And I basically, I pretty much had the whole year off. Like I only trained two or three times a week and just tried to enjoy life basically. Yep. And you almost didn't come back. Cause I remember we spoke uh, around that time. You just got into um, acting. Um, you were in the Deadlands. Talk to us about um, how that all came about. I know you've got a, a talent agency or something. Um, talk to us about how the acting has, has evolved and maybe talk a bit about your goals with, uh, for, for the acting. Yep, so basically I just got uh, super lucky. The casting agent was searching up for big people basically, found me online. I went in for an audition or two, um, managed to get the part and it was so much fun. Like still to this day, it's the, the few acting things I've done have been the best jobs like I've ever had. They're just like so much fun pays good it's not super hard on the body compared to what we do in strongman better than furniture movie <laughs> that's for sure and um yeah i i really want to get back into it um i just feel like i have a few things left to accomplish in strongman first yeah and then yeah i'll i feel like i have to at least give it a shot obviously it's a very hard business to get um get a shot in but i feel like there's always that niche of the big guy role um, so yeah, I'd like to try and give it a shot with what I can. So before we let you go, um, like you just mentioned, there's still a few things left that you want to tick off. So let's talk about what you want to achieve in the next sort of 12, 24 months, maybe even out to three, four, five years uh, in the sport of strongman. What are your goals for the foreseeable future and, um, and where do you see yourself in a few years time? Uh, so with regards to strongman, I really wanted to place top 10 in a, a world level show. So yep. like obviously making finals at World's Strongest Man would be the big one. Um, I really would love to get the opportunity to go to one of the Dubai comps. If it was one of those sort of world level comps, some, that, that was my goal to win top 10 in that. Um, I would love to, if I can get my deadlift up more, go to the deadlift champs. But um, basically I just want to get a few more international comps under my belt before I hang it up. Obviously I got to go to Botswana, so I'd like to go to a few other places. But again, injury depending and COVID is really not yeah. stuff back. So we'll see what happens. So if you weren't doing strong man, what do you think you'd be doing with your life? Um, if I had never gotten into it in the first place, yeah. probably still some kind of MMA uh, type thing. You think you'd ever get back into MMA? I am definitely going to get back into jiu-jitsu. Once, once I stop strongman, I'm going to drop a lot of weight. Yep. It's been fun being this big, but it definitely takes its toll. 
Um, and I, yeah, I can't wait to get back into jujitsu. I don't think I'll ever do MMA again, but I know I find it hard, hard to do something and not put everything into it. So it'll be, I just know when I'm back in that sort of environment, it'll be hard to not do it, but yeah, I so, doubt I will. So we've got one final question and this is uh, from someone that wanted me uh, to ask you this. Um, what do you think in your mind out of all the strength sports, what, which is the true display of strength? Strong man, powerlifting, weightlifting. Um, I think it's strong man. It's got to be, eh? Yeah, it just got the, it's got all of the aspects. And in theory, you could create any event. Um, you could create any lineup of events to test all sorts of different skills. All right. Well, thank you so much to Colm Wolf, three times New Zealand strongest man and absolute legend of the sport of strongman in New Zealand. Uh, we look forward to continuing to follow your journey in the sports of strongman and uh, all the best for the future. Thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs>